Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's make a start. Because um, I want to go home at one point. You probably want to go home as well. Um, so, what I want to do with you today is, in the first session, I want to discuss with you an incredibly useful tool uh, when you are working in the lab and that is related to spectrophotometry. And you can say this word only when you are sober. Trust me, I've tried it. Uh, actually, that's quite a, quite a good alco test. And the police should make use of that. Well, never mind. So that's in the first session. In the second session, um, I want to discuss something that is, well, how shall I tell you? It's very close to my heart. It's a bit about well-being and welfare. Not yours. It's about beta welfare. Because I know by, from my experience that there are lots of people on this planet who would be best classified as data molesters, data abusers. <coughs> this is a horrendous crime. 
and I don't want you to be one of them. So that's in the second part of this session. Okay? In the first part, I want to talk a little bit about spectrophotometry. I'm uh, very sorry, but uh, as soon as the data projector heard that we are going to do something with light, it decided to die, uh, which is just as well. So, you've all seen um, a figure like that that shows you the electromagnetic spectrum. And for us, the most important part, obviously, is a very, very small range. It is actually only this range here that is the visible range that is where we see colors. Most people do, at least. Um, but in a way, God knows what, what that person is on. Um, in a way, if you think about it, we are extremely privileged. <laughs> well, at least turn, your, turn the, turn the uh, sound down. Otherwise, it gets a little bit distracting. And I don't want to listen to myself. I mean, it's bad enough that you have to listen to me, but, uh, you know. Um, we are incredibly uh, privileged because there are lots of animals out there that can't see colors. For example, dogs. Dogs can't see colors. So when you go into a pet shop and buy your dog a really colorful toy, they will hugely appreciate it, the toy. The color, they don't see it. It's a waste of, well, it's, a, it's for the owner. Oh, it's a colorful toy, my, my dog is happy. Uh, what about cats? Can cats see colors? Not all of them? Actually, we only recently found out that cats can actually see colors, but they are not terribly good at seeing colors. It's all a little bit blurry, and uh, it's sort of, you know, like our old computer monitors, where you basically have red, green, and blue, and that's it. So, but if you think about it, Actually, they don't really need to see colors. Uh, as long as they can catch the mice uh, in the dark during nighttime, job done. Why would I want to see colors? There are other animals that see outside our spectrum. So for example, uh, many insects actually uh, see in that range in the UV the close UV range. So for example, bees see very clearly in that range. They also see in probably the rest of the spectrum. And plants use that because if you look at flowers under ultraviolet light, that makes this range, the UV range, visible to the human eye, what you see in some flowers is almost like landing strips for the bees. And the bees can see that. These landing strips actually guide the bees to the interesting parts of the flower. So we are sort of halfway in. By the way, flies, that's interesting. House flies, they don't see in the red, in the red area which again is quite interesting, because uh, they are quite common animals to experiment on, houseflies, but, uh, and especially for, the, for their visual system, but um, you don't want to do the experiments in complete darkness. But luckily, houseflies don't see in the dark, uh, in, the, in the dark red area, so you can have dark, red light on, and for the flies, it's like total darkness. 
which is quite interesting. Now, why do we see colors? How, how come we can recognize colors? And I don't mean the, the biological way. What is going on on a, uh, on, on, a, on, a, on a physical level? Why do we see colors? What's going on? I want to give you an example. Oops. Leaf. Color? Green. Um, what tree is it from? Maple? Let's smoke it. No, we don't. <laughs> Not every weed that you can see can be smoked. What do you think? <coughs> maple. It is maple. Absolutely right. Green leaf. Same tree. Red leaf. <coughs> what the heck is going on? Pigments. Excellent. So we have pigments. But why, actually, why do leaves turn red in autumn? What's going on? And why do we see the different colors? Well, what's happening is that every time you see a color, <coughs> Every time you see a color in this spectrum here, it is because the object reflects some light. And also, light is absorbed by the object. So, if you have a green leaf, What happens is that everything, if, and, and if you shine white light on it, like here, everything is absorbed <coughs> everything is absorbed in the blue and red range of the of the light blue and red but why is it green actually this is the light that is left that is not absorbed all the rest is absorbed and that's why the leaf is green so let's have a look so we absorb basically this one and pretty much this one and this is absorbed by the chlorophyll by the pigment that is used to break down water and create sugar from carbon dioxide GCSE stuff but the reason why leaves are green is because light is absorbed by the chlorophyll in the red and in the blue range and all you see is the green stuff. So then uh, you might argue, uh, OK, master, um, but what about the red leaves? What's happening here with the red leaves? Well, actually, <coughs> plants not only absorb in the blue and in the red, but they also have additional pigments that absorb in the blue uh, up to the yellow range. Now, in autumn, what happens is that the chlorophyll that absorbs in the red and in the blue is degraded. Why is it degraded? because it is an incredibly valuable 
substance, it contains a lot of nitrogen, and you can use and recycle nitrogen uh, and make, for example, amino acids from it. So in autumn, when the leaves fall down, before the leaves fall, chlorophyll is degraded and all the resources are recycled. So chlorophyll is no longer absorbing in the red and in the blue. But you still have the additional, the accessory pigments left, like santins, uh, carotins. And these are compounds that absorb in this range here. And all you have left is these additional <laughs> pigments that don't absorb in the red. That's why you see the leaves red. So what happens actually when light is absorbed? What happens to the matter? And of course, you all know that we have our electron system in compounds. And when a compound, a chemical substance, encounters just the right energy, then electrons are getting excited. Yeah, there's something going on. And they are kicked to another level. They absorb the energy. And I want to show you that, how it actually works. I need a volunteer. Are you? Are you willing to be a volunteer? Okay. Fantastic. What's your name? Olya. Olya. Yeah. Ah. Very active in the chat, aren't you? Kinda. Yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. I like people who are active. Give Olya a big hand. Because she's very brave. Now, I am an electron, right? I'm hanging around with my nucleus here. Hi, nucleus. <laughs> right? And, you know, I'm moving around. And now here comes the shining light. <laughs> <laughs> with soundtrack. Brilliant. <laughs> so what this shining light does is it will give me a push. Push me. <laughs> you see what happens? Not a lot happens. As an electron, you know, I'm wandering around. Oh, yeah, there's a little bit of, no, I'm not really interested in that light. It doesn't have, it doesn't feel right. It doesn't have the right energy, right? Now kick me a little bit harder. <laughs> harder? Oh, yeah! I am pushed onto the next level. Hey, how cool is that? That was exactly the right energy. Right? That is what I absorb. I'm now on a higher level. Ooh. Floating on a higher level. And sometimes when the energy is no longer there, I just simply say, oh, actually, where's my, where, well, oh, there's my new, should go down, really, shouldn't I? So I jump down, and the energy that I just received is emitted again. I send it out. That is fluorescence. But the big thing is, I need to have exactly the right energy. Push me very hard. With the... With the wrong energy, even if it is a lot of energy, I break down. There's nothing there. It's the wrong energy. I don't get up to the next level. Give me the right level. Yep. Brilliant. You see? I need to have exactly the right energy. I need to have exactly the right color because energy and color are directly related. I need to have exactly the right color. Thank you very much. You have been a shining light. So
So this is what happens when light interacts with matter. And it doesn't have to be light. It can be anything from this electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, for certain compounds, we need different wavelengths. And that is because the, the electrons of these compounds absorb different energies. Make sense? Yeah? So if you've got that, you understand spectrophotometry. And well, we can actually go home. Now, what can you do with this understanding? Well, oh, we have a low again. The connection, but we just simply ignore that because perhaps at one point it will go away. Now, what can we do with that? We know that light interacts with matter. Now, let's do a little experiment. This is my light source. <coughs> How beautiful is that? And this light source sends out light. Oh, massive. And I indicate that like that. Just simply sort of light waves. We know that uh, light can have different forms. It can be a wave, like I've indicated here, or it can be a particle, uh, a photon. Can you actually measure the weight of a photon? Can you measure weight of photons? <coughs> There's a brilliant experiment. What you do is, you, you, what you need is a total vacuum. So with a very strong vacuum pump. And you put one of these scales in this vacuum. One side is kept in the dark. The other side, you shine a very strong light source on it. And what you see is that the side where the light source is shining onto the scales goes like that. So you can actually measure the weight of light. Bizarre as it sounds, but you can. Anyway, we shine this light onto, let's say, some a glass container, and in this glass container, we have a solution. And there are some compounds in that. And these compounds, these molecules, will absorb light. So every time one of these compounds is hit by these light waves, it will absorb the light, it will absorb the energy, and therefore less energy will come out. If I look at the other side. Make sense? Yeah? Okay, what would happen if I have exactly the same thing, <coughs> what did he say? <laughs> what would happen if I increase the concentration of my absorbing things. What would happen with the light? How much light do I get out at the end? More or less than? Less. No, I don't have these laxatives. <laughs> but you can get them in the pharmacy or if you have a good connection uh, to a vet, uh, just ask for a big mic. 
These are laxatives for horses. <laughs> well, you've asked for it. So, the light that gets through depends on the concentration. The higher the concentration, the less light gets through. <coughs> Make sense? So, let's just simply note that down. What we are talking about is actually called absorbance. Absorbance of the light. And very often it is abbreviated just simply by an A. Sometimes people also put down the wavelength at which they did the experiment. So sometimes you find something like 660. That stands for 660 nanometer. And that just indicates the color of the light. Because we know that we have to have exactly the right color, the right energy of the light so that it does something. So the absorbance depends <coughs> on the concentration. of the substance. Let's bear that in mind. So we can say absorbance <coughs> depends on concentration, C. And this quiggle <whistles> just indicates it's directly proportional. The more concentration I have, the more light will be absorbed. What would happen If I just simply make the travel distance larger, I still have the same concentration as I had before, but the travel distance is larger. No, trust me, you don't want to eat the horse laxatives. You would do that for a moment, but what would happen if I make this the container wider? More light through or less? less? Less light, because the light has more chance to bump into the molecules that would absorb it. So in this case, we get less light again. So the absorbance also depends on the path length. So A, let's say 660, depends on the length. And I indicate that with, a, with an L. On the length, how far the light has to travel. And these two things, this one and this one here, provide us with some extremely useful stuff. It provides us with what is called the Lambert Beer Law. And this Lambert Beer Law says absorbance equals 
It's no longer proportional. It's an, it's an equation. Equals concentration times the path length times sort of an adjustment factor. This adjustment factor is usually abbreviated with something like a Greek E, an epsilon, it's also called extinction coefficient. And sometimes you will see that this A, this absorbance, is also called extinction. Although I don't like this. This, 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 this sounds like <laughs> yeah, dead. No, it's just absorbed. The energy is absorbed. Does it make sense so far? Now, what does the extinction coefficient actually <coughs> depend on? It can depend on a lot of things. The extinction coefficient actually is a number and a unit that depends actually on exactly the conditions under which I do a measurement. OK, let's have a look. I just mentioned units. Let's uh, do a quick uh, thing about units. Now, A. The absorbance is a very, very poor thing. I feel really sorry for it because this poor thing has no unit. It's almost like an orphan. You have to feel sorry for it. It doesn't really know what it is. It's unitless. I'm so sad. There's no unit in it. But can we figure out the rest of the units? Concentration. What is the unit for concentration? It could be mole per liter. Exactly. Well done. It could be gram per milliliter. As long as it's a concentration, yeah, absolutely fine. Mole per liter. <coughs> the path length <coughs> that the light has to travel, we usually use standard measurements. And this is usually given either in meters or more common in <coughs> centimeters. And what you will find is very, you, very, very common is a path length of one centimeter. <coughs> and I'll show you the experimental setup in a minute. All right? Now, big question, extinction coefficient. What unit do you expect this to be? Can we make a prediction what unit this should be? Exactly. Something that cancels out the first two units. So we have mole per liter for our concentration times centimeter. And now we just simply say for our epsilon, we have liter per mole. Oops. 
times centimeter. That is the unit for our extinction coefficient. We can also write this as molar to the power of minus one centimeter to the power of minus one, which is exactly the same thing. Does that make sense? <coughs> yeah? Don't forget, the only orphan that we have is the A. We always need to add the units for the extinction coefficient. It's absolutely mandatory. Yeah? So how can we use that? Well, we can, with a very simple setup, with a light source of the right energy, <coughs> correct energy, that is correct wavelength, We use a container. This container has to make, has to let the light through, of course. If the container itself blocks the light, it's pretty pointless, right? This container could be glass, it could be plastic, it could be anything that lets the energy through. Actually, it doesn't have to be light that we can see. It could be for example, UV light that we can't see, only the bees can see. Yeah? But if this light has the right energy to interact with the matter, it doesn't matter whether we can see it or not. So here we have a container. This is very often called a cuvette. This container. And very, very often you will find that this container has one centimeter path length. <coughs> you add li your liquid, which has a substance in it, and you want to measure the concentration of the substance. So all you need to do is shine the light, put the substance, the cuvette, with the substance in it, into the beam of the light, and just simply measure what comes out at the other end. And from that, you have, you measure your absorbance. You know this one, the path length. And for many, many substances, you also know your extinction coefficient. So all you need to know, all you need to do is you rearrange the Beer Lambert law. and look for the concentration. <coughs> and voila, you get your concentration of the substance. So this simple arrangement with just the right light and a measurement of how much energy comes out at the end allows you to measure concentrations. And these concentration measurements are pretty accurate. Of course, being a decent bioscientist, you just don't go around with a torch and you know, shine light onto a plastic bottle 
or something like, although the principle is exactly the same. You have fancy equipment, they're usually bloody expensive, so if you mess it up, it's two, three thousand pound. They are called spectrophotometers. You probably have worked with them, have you? Uh, at the university? No, not yet? A level. So you will next week, I guess, you will, or the week after, you will use spectrophotometers to measure DNA concentrations. And as I said, you have a light source in here. You have a cuvette holder. And you have something that measures how much light goes through. Very simple thing. And then you have a little display here, which measures the <coughs> absorbance. So 0 0.01, for example, gives you the absorbance. If you put in in your cuvette, <coughs> double the concentration, it will go to 0 0.02. So it allows you to make a direct connection between the concentration and the absorbance. And all you need to know is, in this case, what is my cuvette path length? As I said, very standard, one centimeter, but it can be also much smaller or much bigger. And you need to know your extinction coefficient. And then you can directly convert the absorbance into a concentration. How cool is that? Sometimes the latest technology is you don't use a cuvette. What you can do is You use a little droplet that is hanging on a surface and usually in a water environment droplets have a very, very defined size. And people who came up with, with this idea did a lot of testing and they found that the size of the droplets, the path length of the droplets, is pretty much constant. These droplets are usually less than 0 0.1 millimeter wide. They can be up to uh, <coughs> one micrometer wide sometimes. And all you need to do is shoot some light through it. And again, you have <coughs> something that measures the light. And it tells you the concentration of it. These things are called, actually, nanodrop. <coughs> the last time I bought a nanodrop, that was a few years ago, it set me back. 12 and a half thousand pound. Why is it so good? Well, if you use a normal spectrophotometer, you have to use a lot of the substance here. And if your substance is very precious, you will basically waste precious substance. In a nanodrop, you just use a little drop a single microliter of a substance, and you don't waste a lot. So nanodrop allows you to measure things very accurately, accurately in very, very small volumes. And that makes it really, really nice and beautiful to work with. So far, so good. Yeah? No major problems? There's one problem, just one. 
I told you that this epsilon depends on the conditions under which an experiment is done. Yeah, it's probably not more than three textbooks that you can buy with a nanodrop, but uh, you know. But actually, when you come to Klapper's lectures, you don't need any textbooks. Because you get all the information there. So you still can invest it in a nanodrop, or if you're so inclined, think about how many hamburgers you can buy. <laughs> Am I right? Yes? He doesn't say anything now. Probably the word hamburger or cheeseburger has uh, <coughs> tipped them over the edge. Clapper is the book, yes. At least he didn't, they didn't say Clapper is the cheeseburger. <laughs> now, epsilon, our extinction coefficient, <coughs> the extinction coefficient <coughs> depends on the conditions of the experiment. Very often you have extinction coefficients published under exactly <coughs> the right conditions. Connection lost. Oh, I'm so sorry. We just simply ignore them. Um, so what can we do if we don't know exactly what the extinction coefficient is? We are screwed, hey? Nah. There is a solution to problems. What we can do is actually, we can use very well defined concentrations. Known concentrations. And for each known concentration of our substance, we measure the corresponding absorbance. OK? And we can say, We basically here have four equations and we could calculate the extinction coefficient from that. So we could say epsilon 1 equals A1 over C1 L epsilon 2 equals A2 over C2 L and so on and so forth. So we get a lot of different equations. We could uh, solve them for epsilon. Or what we could do even easier is we just simply plot our stuff. So here we plot our different known concentrations mole per liter And here we plot the absorbance. So we get a nice 
graph in a way where we get concentration, where we get a relationship between absorbance and concentration. And this now determines basically our epsilon, <coughs> our extinction coefficient, for this particular experiment. If we do the experiment in the same way for an unknown, unknown concentration Cx, so let's say we have an unknown concentration Cx, and this unknown con concentration Cx gives us an absorbance gives us this absorbance. What we can do is we just simply use our graph to find Cx. So I measure the absorbance of the unknown and just read off the concentration of the unknown just by going down, and I get my Cx. This graph, this trick, this trick is actually called a standard curve. or standard graph. Why standard? Because these things here, the C1, C2, C3, C4, they are sort of our standard that we use to measure things. And you will do that at nauseam. You will produce beautiful standard curves throughout your entire career. Standard curve, standard curve, standard curve. Because you need these standard curves to find <laughs> unknown concentrations. Does that make sense? And I, in the second part now, I will tell you what not to do with standard curves. And become a data molester, or rather not a data molester. I suggest we have five, six minutes break. Stand up, walk around, and come back. <laughs>